Um, my name is uh, Andre Lev Weisberg, and I'm a general internist at Lutheran General Hospital. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Illinois. Orlando, can you? There we go. And okay. Okay, again. So my name is Dr. Andre Lev Weisberg. I am a um, general internal medicine. Uh, in private practice that I started myself about eight years ago after my residency at Lutheran General. And um, I'm very excited to talk about a topic that um, is really brings me outside of my water and my normal character because I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a general internal medicine doctor. But I work very closely with psychiatrists. In fact, I was able to retain a psychiatrist and a psychologist for my practice and my patient. And they work in my practice to help me deal with um, issues that my patients uh, always challenge me with. Uh, psychiatric issues in internal medicine are very prevalent, very common, and when I developed my own practice, I thought that a psychiatrist, psychologist, as well as a geriatrician should be an integral part of my practice. So unfortunately, Dr. Shukman has, um, was is not able to be here, uh, but he asked me um, as a favor many months ago to do this, and we've been working very, very closely together to develop this presentation. Um, I think this is actually the wrong presentation, so I need to open. I apologize for this. We had several uh, versions of this, so I want to make sure I open the right version of this. Unfortunately, it's not, but we're going to go anyway. So um, I'm here to talk about uh, low-dose endorphin, uh, low-dose naltrexone in the role that it plays in the treatment of psychiatric disorders. And uh, this is a uh, very interesting topic because, and I'm very excited about this, because number one, low-dose naltrexone is a very safe uh, and very uh, well-tolerated, uh, usually, um, uh, regimen uh, that uh, has a tremendous potential in the treatment of inflammatory conditions. Um, and uh, honestly, there's not a lot, uh, not as much of research in psychiatric world on this as even there is in medical world. So this is actually kind of new and exciting. Um, uh, and actually, I think we're standing on the verge of some new horizons and some new research possibilities when it comes to uh, Low dose no track zone. Okay. 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 I hope this is better. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about the neurobiologic significance of low dose naltrexone first because I think as a way of um, uh, introduction we need to get um, to the basics, the um, basic science of how it works in order to really understand uh, what it does um, for a patient with psychiatric illness. Some of the objectives that I have today uh, is to review uh, this neurobiologic significance, uh, to review different neuropsychiatric models of endorphin deficiency. What actually happens when patients become endorphin deficient? I would like to discuss the pathophysiologic models of depression and how low-dose naltrexone uh, therapy is relevant to the treatment of depression, um, as well as to demonstrate the connection between clinical depression and chronic illness to emphasize that clinical depression is a synchronon. It's an ever-present problem in patients with chronic illness. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about how uh, low-dose naltrexone works in modifying sleep architecture. And this is a topic that's very dear to my heart because about 20% of what I do in my general internal medicine practice is I deal with sleep disorders. And I actually uh, am a member of American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, emerging roles for low-dose naltrexone and uh, what Dr. Shukman in his practice has developed as a protocol for the treatment of addiction, potentially obesity, and um, uh, some other repetitive uh, conditions that he runs across. So we're going to talk a little bit about opioid receptors and nomenclature. I don't have, unfortunately, the slides for this, but I'm going to emphasize the important points. Uh, there, are, there are at least four different opioid receptors that are distributed throughout the body. I'm going to focus uh, on their uh, presence 
in the various structures in the brain, because that's where the psychiatric manifestations most commonly uh, are uh, uh, present. And obviously, brain pathology and uh, psychiatric uh, manifestations thereof uh, are the center of how low-dose naltrexone will help us treat these patients. So there's a delta receptor, which was named after the vast deference tissue, actually, in the human reproductive tract. And um, uh, that uh, receptor actually is also located in the brain, in the brain tissue. It's located um, in various structures. It causes analgesia. It co causes antidepressant effect. Uh, it's actually a convulsant, so it can actually cause seizures. And it actually mediates some of the physical dependence that uh, opioids uh, produce, and it's part of uh, treatment with opioid medications. Uh, there is a receptor called the nociceptive receptor 1, which is um, also known as the opioid-like receptor. It's an endogenous antagonist of the dopamine transport, and it actually can act to either directly uh, work on the dopamine system or by inhibiting the GABA uh, receptors, which are very, very important. We'll see that in a second, that the GABA system and the dopamine systems are integral in the pathophysiology of depression and they're therefore very important in the treatment of these diseases. Um, this nociceptive receptor, or opioid-like receptor 1, also works um, uh, and is present in the GI tract. It, pro it helps uh, process memories. It's present on cardiovascular and renal structures. Um, it uh, mediates some of the locomotor of the movement activities. Um, it's also uh, important for the movement of the GI tract. It's, uh, when it's agonized by an opioid molecule, it actually increases anxiety. Um, it's a neurotransmitter. This particular receptor is present for the neurotransmitters in the peripheral tissues and central sites. So this is one of the receptors that's present, not just in the brain, but in other areas. Um, there is uh, also the classic morphine receptor, or the mu receptor, which mediates the physical dependence of the opioid medications. Uh, it mediates the uh, GI motility, and most people, patients who are on um, opioids have reduced GI motility. also mediates physical dependence. Finally, there's a kappa receptor um, that is present in the spinal cord, in the substantia gelatinosa, in the area of the spinal cord that's most dorsal, has to do with uh, input from some of the uh, peripheral sensory uh, tissues, and also in the hypothalamus and the claustrum. Kappa receptor uh, is important for, um, as a neuroprotectant. It's important in uh, sedation, in causing uh, some of the somnolence that is observed when people are using opioids. And it's also important for um, uh, analgesia or uh, pain uh, control properties. So next we're going to talk about, I would like to go to this slide, uh, and talk about the interactions between the various structures inside the brain. Um, there is a ventral tegmental area, which is in the frontal uh, midbrain. And uh, that's where the uh, uh, GABA receptors are present. And these inhibit the release of dopamine. And you can see the key point is that um, there is a very, very close association between the endorphin, beta endorphin pathways, and dopamine release. So this is where all of this is going to start to get, come together as we talk about uh, LDN. LDN low-dose naltrexone by working on the opioid receptors and the beta endorphin pathways will actually increase dopamine. And this is part of the reason why you get into the side effects such as nausea. Um, LDN increases the endorphins, and um, these endorphins, Dr. Battle uh, mentioned it, a lot of what I'm going to be saying is going to be echoed by what the previous presenters have said in the peripheral tissues um, when they discuss the role of low-dose naltrexone uh, at its sites outside the brain. Uh, so um, uh, endorphins are very, very important in the release of dopamine, and uh, dopamine is a very, very important neurotransmitter that's implicated in a multitude of psychiatric conditions. Um, this slide also depicts the mechanism by which the release of endorphins leads to the release of dopamine. This is, this is the connection between the two systems. Um, so. so LDN um, can be used for the treatment of depression. Um, this uh, assumption 
was uh, actually tested out by a group of uh, scientists who tried to uh, uh, give patients endorphins uh, for the treatment of depression. And what they found out is that giving patients endorphins, injecting patients with endorphins, actually causes a little bit of mania and reverses their uh, symptoms of depression. Um, It's also very, very crucial for us to ask the question of does naltrexone cause depression? Can it actually cause psychiatric effects uh, that are untoward? And this um, question has been answered by a variety of, uh, by a number of studies. And um, uh, the answer was a resounding no. Naltrexone and sulfuram in patients, uh, when used for patients with alcohol dependence, did not lead to any, lead to any significant depression. Okay, the next question that we have to answer is, is depression really a normal part uh, of, um, of, uh, of, um, uh, of an illness, of a chronic d disease? And I think that to answer that question, I think we have to turn back to some of the things that have been said about antibodies and autoimmune diseases. And this is where the connection between autoimmune disease and depression really comes to light. Depression is not a normal or adaptive feature of, um, of um, chronic disease. Depression arises as a consequence of inflammatory um, uh, disruption that is really a central part of diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia. And so uh, depression is um, um, not a normal reaction. Uh, and uh, instead of treating depression as a side effect or a, uh, a side problem to some of these conditions, uh, we are now beginning to focus on the common mechanism that exists between depression and the inflammatory conditions. Uh, one study that I would like to cite is a study of uh, about 40 lupus patients that have been um, uh, stratified based on the type of antibody that they had uh, and the symptoms of depression. Those patients with lupus that had a certain type of ribonucle ribonuclear uh, antibody um, were much more likely to have depression than patients who did not have this particular antibody. So there is a connection, and I think that uh, more and more um, work needs to be done to unveil uh, this uh, connection. low dose naltrexone in treating the underlying inflammatory problem can also address the underlying depression and psychiatric dysfunction that occurs. So having an illness is difficult, uh, not to say that it's not difficult. Um, most patients with chronic uh, disease will have some degree of uh, fatigue, some degree of uh, insomnia. Uh, it's a double burden when they have a chronic medical condition where their joints are aching, uh, where they're not able to swallow, uh, if they have uh, Sjogren's disease or scleroderma or lupus. Um, DSM-4, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, that's the Bible of uh, making a diagnosis um, uh, in the psychiatric world, uh, distinguishes between the two reactions. Um, and um, a psychiatrist is really critical in making the distinction between normal adaptation and true depression. So some of the same symptoms are uh, present on both sides. Feeling of emptiness or loss, dysphoria, or this feeling of uh, intense uh, emotional pain um, uh, that is triggered by a reaction to illness, pain or grief, preoccupation with thoughts about changes that now will have to take place as the patient adapts uh, to the physical uh, dysfunction of his disease. So in order to make a diagnosis of depression, you need four out of nine uh, classical symptoms. And, um, you know, it's, it's um, critical that a, a skilled person skilled in treating depression uh, comes up with this diagnosis. This is one of my favorite slides, actually. It illustrates the biochemical connection uh, between the various substances that are involved in depression. Remember what we just learned, dopamine and beta endorphins are closely linked together uh, in the brain. Um, and in the peripheral structures. Uh, beta endorphins mediate the release of endorphins. Dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine are central in explaining the pathophysiology of depression. Uh, enough to say that dopamine also acts as a precursor biochemically to the synthesis of serotonin and norepinephrine, norepinephrine in particular, and epinephrine. So all of these 
chemicals in the brain are really intertwined in a way that we still have very poor ability to understand. But what we do understand is it's not necessarily the absolute level of dopamine. It's not necessarily the absolute level of serotonin. It's the modulation of these various factors that is very, very critical. And for that reason, I would like to go back to the slide where we talked about the various, or actually we didn't have a slide for this, we talked about the various receptors for opioids or endorphins in the, in the body. As you remember, there, there's a delta receptor, kappa, and, and mu. There's also this uh, um, morphine-like uh, receptor. Low-dose naltrexone has been shown to have various binding to these receptors. It binds in a different fashion to each one of them. And in doing so, it really acts um, as a modulator as opposed to a blocker. Um, when I was asked to give this presentation, I, I was very excited because I was going to talk about some of the issues that I have with classical traditional medicine. And one issue that I had as a medical student and a young physician was that we've learned how to block things. We've learned how to um, potentiate certain receptors. But we really have not learned how to modulate a lot of things very well. And this was somewhat frustrating to me because I always thought that as a physician I would be able to pick and uh, create a cocktail of medications that would serve a certain purpose. With low-dose naltrexone, one medication, one drug, can actually accomplish a modulation of different receptors that can be very, very productive. To give an analogy to this, um, I, play, I play the piano as a pastime, and uh, actually Dr. Schuchman plays the violin. I liken it to a difference between playing a single note on a keyboard to playing uh, or taking a chord which has several different actions. I mean, the difference in sound, the difference in action is a lot different. So low-dose naltrexone is kind of like playing, a, uh, taking a musical chord as opposed to playing a single note when it comes, uh, when, we, when we're talking about a patient's biochemical uh, environment. So I really would like to advocate for a change in the psychiatric world, uh, and as an internist, I really do have a bigger picture, from thinking about depression as a normal part uh, or reaction to chronic disease to um, a, a problem that's real, uh, a problem that's really part of the pathophysiology of the underlying disease, especially when we're talking about uh, chronic inflammatory conditions. There's also a dopamine uh, theory that uh, has been linked uh, to the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease. And in treating patients with Parkinson's disease, uh, very frequently they would come to me with s symptoms of severe, severe depression. As we know, Parkinson's disease has to do with depletion of dopamine in the uh, central uh, uh, brain structures. The same happens when we use medications like reserpine or antipsychotics. Very frequently they will have significant psychiatric effects. Reserpine was, uh, was chastised for being a, a depressant. Um, even though it was a fairly good uh, medication in many other ways. Uh, many of our antidepressants um, utilize this dopamine um, theory by increasing the levels of dopamine in the, in the brain. One of these antidepressants is Wilbutrin. So what has really not been studied well and what Dr. Schuchman is proposing is to, is to study the role of low-dose naltrexone with various antidepressants and to study this systematically, to see what happens when we use low-dose naltrexone with uh, other medications. Coincidentally, there was a question in the, in the uh, lecture by Dr. Mendel, what happens when we use naltrexone um, or low-dose naltrexone? Why, why can't we use... Um, opioids uh, concurrently with no, low-dose naltrexone. Well, and I think his answer was, yes, we can use it. It's a myth. We can use this uh, drug together with opioids. Low-dose naltrexone actually potentiates, according to some studies, um, the response to opioids. It actually somehow increases body's natural uh, ability to respond to stimulation from a morphine-like endorphin-like medication. And so there's actually, in the, in the product insert, insert for naltrexone, there is, a, there is a caution by the FDA that low, naltrexone can lead to sudden respiratory depression when used concurrently with, uh, with opioids. So it's not even a question of whether it's going to reverse the function or reverse the, uh, reverse the um, uh, uh, role of a medication like morphine. Low-dose naltrexone may actually increase the body's response to a medication like morphine. So a much smaller dose 
will need to be used. So I'm hoping, I, I hope I'm painting a picture for low-dose naltrexone in the, in the world of psychiatry as a molecule that has some magical pleiotropic effects that are really outside of its ability to bind and block these various receptors. It has a much, much bigger, much more uh, important role. Um, this is a painting, a pretty famous painting, uh, which illustrates, uh, you know, that you can't really take a patient outside of the, uh, of his or her environment. A patient is really part of, uh, of the milieu. And this chronic illness um, really becomes a part of everything that surrounds the patient. You know, the sheets, uh, you know, the choice of uh, wardrobe. Um, the patient really cannot be separate from the, from the milieu. And, um, why does this take place? Well, in studying behaviors of animals who were presented with inflammatory markers, uh, scientists have discovered that uh, they manifest, manifest all the symptoms of depression and psychiatric illness. Why does this take place? Well, it turns out that this takes place as a way of conserving energy. Believe it or not, illness brings together with it an adaptive response where an animal will try to conserve some of its energy from bathing, grooming, whatever else, to focus more on the illness. Um, we know from treating patients with various inflammatory markers that depression is an ever-present synchronon um, uh, factor. For example, in using interferon for treating patients with uh, uh, hepatitis C, majority of these patients develop depression. And uh, treating uh, such patients really requires a multidisciplinary approach that integrates the knowledge of psychiatric factors, use of psychiatric medications, et cetera. Um, same interleukins that Dr. Battle talked about, same chemicals uh, really participate in the disease process of behavioral changes that take place in patients with chronic illness. So the treatment implications of this are tremendous. Uh, and actually, there is a study um, uh, that was actually a double-blinded randomized controlled trial of uh, Remicade in depressed patients, which showed dramatic improvements. For some reason, for the same reason, ibuprofen has been used with varying degrees of success for the treatment of depression for the purpose of decreasing the inflammation. Uh, there also, um, I also see frequently when they round on patients in the psychiatric unit, that the psychiatrist put them on omega-3 to reduce the inflammatory response, improve their uh, depression. Daplin is a um, uh, folic acid um, cognate that um, has been used um, for the purpose of decreasing inflammation produced by homocysteine accumulation, an inflammatory uh, byproduct of um, uh, in the B12 uh, folate cycle. And so LDN, um, I think, is showing a lot of promise in the treatment of, um, uh, of psychiatric conditions for the same purpose of decreasing inflammation. And some of the studies that have been already presented in the, in the areas of fibromyalgia, in a lot of the overlap conditions that exist between the realm of traditional medicine and psychiatry, traditions that require a multidisciplinary approach, LDN has been already scientifically proven to work uh, almost miracles in those conditions. Um, so uh, one protocol that Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Shukman has developed, which is very, very exciting, is called the Sinclair method. Uh, it's based on the Sinclair method, and it's called the modified Sinclair method. Uh, it's based on the assumption that um, uh, modifying dopamine will actually change the reward cycle uh, in the patient who has addiction uh, issues. And this can actually work not just for addiction, but also for any condition that, that causes repetitive, um, stereotyped, uh, almost innate uh, emotional responses, such as overeating, chronic itching that uh, um, was presented with a, in a patient with uh, lupus, I believe. Um, so uh, the idea is that in the initial Sinclair method, in the original Sinclair method, dopamine uh, antagonism of naltrexone was used as a way to extinguish a patient's um, natural craving for alcohol. An idea would be to give him naltrexone, have the patient continue to use alcohol, the addiction would be extinguished because, as you remember, some of the addictive 
uh, effects of opioid receptors would be blocked. Well, Dr. Schuchman is in, ingenious in his own way, uh, suggested that this same method can be combined with behavioral therapies in a multidisciplinary approach to extinguish many other behaviors. And he's actually tried this in a number of patients. The interesting uh, uh, ramification of this is that low-dose naltrexone has a, an action that's different from uh, regular dose naltrexone in that it has only transient affinity for opioid receptors. There's a time in the day when the opioid receptors are not antagonized, when the low-dose naltrexone is not around. And that might be the time to put a patient through behavioral counseling session and try to extinguish some of the behaviors. It also depends on how long the patient has been on low-dose naltrexone. Two months or three months, the effects of behavioral therapies in Dr. Schuchman's experience are different. So he calls this the modified Sinclair method, and I think it's an um, uh, incredibly promising uh, way with very few side effects to treat patients for a variety of disorders uh, ranging from uh, obesity, uh, to addiction. To this effect, a number of clinical trials um, have been proposed and already are being conducted in the uh, database that keeps track of the clinical trials. There is a trial of low-dose naltrexone in the treatment of depression relapse. There is a trial of low-dose naltrexone in, in children with pervasive developmental disorder, um, and as well as uh, various trials that uh, that seek to uh, make the connection uh, for weight loss with low dose naltrexone. So, with this, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. And um, uh, I'm, as I said, I'm really excited to, to be here. Um, and we'll entertain questions uh, at a later point.